Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here today uh, talking with you. Um, I have uh, personal connections with Maine. All four of my daughter's grandparents live here in southern Maine. And uh, so it's great to be up here um, and talk about this topic, which of course is one of great interest uh, to, to folks um, in, in the state of Maine, um, climate change and the impact that it's going to have on our lives. I'm going to talk about sort of some of my experiences um, in the climate change debate um, as uh, what you might call a, a reluctant and accidental uh, public figure in the debate over climate change because of a graph that uh, I published a decade and a half ago, the so-called uh, hockey stick graph. And it sor sort of has put me in the, the center of the larger debate over climate change. Um, and I've sort of embraced that opportunity uh, to, to talk about the, the larger issues involved. And, and that's what I'd like to do here today. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that the science is actually quite straightforward, despite what you may have heard you know, from uh, certain talking heads, uh, certain cable news networks. Um, uh, we have known for nearly two centuries that certain gases in the atmosphere, so-called greenhouse gases, warm the surface of the planet. We know that we are increasing the concentrations of these gases, um, and for some reason slower than <laughs> they should be, um, to levels that it turns out we have not seen probably in several million years. Earlier this year, we came off the top of this graph uh, you have to draw another uh, line here. Um, we crossed the 400 parts per million CO2 level for the first time, we believe, in several million years. So we're engaged in this unprecedented experiment uh, with our climate. But the fact is that that's all you need to know. Basic physics and chemistry we've known for nearly two centuries irrefutable evidence that we are raising the concentrations of these greenhouse gases to unprecedented levels. What I would not be able to explain to you as a climate scientist would be if the Earth were not warming up as a result of that. And of course it is warming up. Uh, it's warmed up a little less than a degree Celsius over the past century. And if you're a critic, and there are critics, um, and you don't accept the evidence from thermometer measurements around the world, uh, there are literally uh, dozens of other lines of evidence that tell us that the planet is warming up, that the climate is changing in precisely the way we expect it to as we increase the concentrations of these gases through fossil fuel burning and other activities. Um, and that led the IPCC um, in its most recent report, uh, just released weeks ago, to conclude that warming of the climate system is now unequivocal. Okay, that's, that's not being debated anymore by climate scientists. Now, none of that was based on climate models. Another claim you'll sometimes hear from the critics is that um, you know, everything that we know about climate change is based on these uh, theoretical models that we supposedly shouldn't trust. But that isn't true. I already presented the evidence that we are warming the planet, and that had nothing to do with climate models. It was based on simple physical principles we've known for nearly two centuries, irrefutable measurements of uh, the composition, the changing composition of our atmosphere, and measurements that confirm it's warming up as we expect it to. Now, we do use models to test hypotheses. Um, after all, the critics will try to tell you that you know, maybe the warming is due to natural factors. How do we know it's due to greenhouse gas increases? Maybe it's due to volcanoes that come and go, and they can warm, uh, they can cool the climate. And if you have a change in sort of volcanic activity, that can lead to a trend in, t in temperature over time. And there's small but measurable changes in the output of the sun. Well, we can put those factors into the climate models. We have pretty good estimates of how both the solar output and volcanic activity has varied over the past century and a half, and we can drive the climate models with that. And it turns out the climate models want to cool in recent decades in response to natural factors. The climate has warmed in spite of natural factors that should have caused it to cool slightly. And in fact, we can only explain the warming that we've seen through human activity, in particular the burning of fossil fuels, increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases. And that's what led uh, the IPCC in its most recent report to conclude that it is extremely likely, that's very strong language uh, for a report based on 
the contributions of thousands of scientists around the world and hundreds of authors to come to a conclusion that something is extremely likely. That's about as strong a conclusion you'll ever see in a consensus scientific report. Um, extremely likely means the connection between human activity and global warming is as strong as scientists assess the connection to be between smoking tobacco products and lung cancer and other health impacts. All right, so what about the future? Well, if we were to cease fossil fuel burning right now, uh, we could hold global warming below two degrees Celsius. All right, that's two degrees Celsius, about four and a half degrees uh, Fahrenheit. We could hold warming below that two degrees Celsius level. And why do I mention two degrees? That's the amount of warming that's, uh, that most scientists who study the impacts of climate change will tell you commits us to the most dangerous and potentially irreversible changes in climate. Um, so that's really a level of warming we don't want to go beyond. And if we could stop fossil fuel burning cold right now, we would in all likelihood avoid that amount of warming. On the other hand, if we continue with business as usual, we're going to be somewhere in that red zone. We're talking, you know, somewhere between uh, uh, four to five degrees Celsius, um, seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit, twice that much in the Arctic, okay? As much as 18 degrees Fahrenheit warming of the Arctic because of some of the amplifying factors involved, the melting of ice and the additional warming that that brings. So in that scenario, you know, as uh, James Hansen of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, um, uh, one of the first scientists to speak out on the threat of climate change, as he has described it, um, in that scenario we will be leaving our, our children and grandchildren and the kids in the upper uh, deck here, uh, all of you, um, a fundamentally different planet from the planet uh, that the rest of us grew up on. Now I realize, you know, Maine is you know, one of the northern states, but we're not quite up in the domain of the, the polar bear, which is an iconic species that we know is likely to be impacted by climate change. But on the flight up here um, yesterday, I was uh, surfing the web and I came across an article, um, perhaps the most iconic species of uh, Maine, the moose. Uh, moose populations are decreasing dramatically um, in, in the United States, um, in Minnesota, in New Hampshire, um, and presumably now in Maine as well. Um, there was an article about that just yesterday in the, in the New York Times. Um, and they concluded that climate change is likely playing a role here, either because it allows ticks to live through the mild winters and ticks uh, uh, afflict uh, moose um, and they are ad have an adverse uh, impact on the health of uh, moose populations. Um, and there are a variety of other factors that may be uh, influenced and exacerbated by climate change. Um, so this hits uh, fairly close to home. Um, and this is true around the world. In whatever state I could be talking, about, uh, talking in today, uh, there would be a story about how climate change is fundamentally likely to change the, the complexion of that state um, in an adverse way. So given you know, that the science is this clear and that the threat is this clear, why have we not yet engaged in any meaningful action to deal with this problem? And of course that takes us from the domain of science into the domain of policy and politics. And ironically, um, Angus King couldn't be here today uh, because of uh, the threat to shut down our government. Well, it turns out that the same folks who are behind the threat to shut down our government are also behind the multi-million dollar disinformation campaign to convince the American public that climate change doesn't pose a threat. It's the very same organizations, the very same people, the very same pair of brothers from Kansas, in fact. And so that's been their approach. Uh, back in 2002, there was a memo that was leaked uh, uh, by, uh, from a Republican pollster, Frank Luntz, which sort of betrayed the strategy that the fossil fuel industry had decided to take. Um, basically, what the memo said was there was a closing window of opportunity here. Uh, the public was becoming convinced that there is a scientific consensus behind climate change. And if they become convinced, they will demand policy action be taken. But there's still a narrow window of opportunity, he said, to confuse the public, 
to make them think that there isn't a scientific consensus, to fund think tanks and front groups and paid advocates whose job it is to convince the public that the science is, uh, is too uh, weak to act upon. And so, you know, if that sounds like a familiar strategy to you, it's because it's the same strategy that the tobacco industry used decades ago. It's now being used by the, tobacco, by the uh, fossil fuel industry. In fact, some of the same paid advocates who were advocating for the tobacco industry as experts then are advocating for the fossil fuel industry as supposed climate change experts. And so, you know, we end up having, you know, senators like the senior senator from the hottest state ever. Oklahoma became the hottest state uh, two summers ago. Um, and that summer, James Inhofe, the senior senator of Oklahoma, was still describing climate change as the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Um, well, he had been invited, in fact, that summer to give the keynote lecture at the Heartland Institute Climate Change Conference. The Heartland Institute is an industry-funded front group, essentially, um, that uh, worked for the tobacco industry in past decades, is working for the fossil fuel industry to basically execute a disinformation uh, campaign about climate change. Um, and every year they hold a climate change denial conference. Um, they had invited James Inhofe to be their keynote speaker that summer, uh, and unfortunately he had to cancel out at the last minute. Um, he had gotten ill swimming in a lake back uh, in his home state of Oklahoma, was uh, suffering from an algal bloom as a result of the unprecedented heat and drought that Oklahoma was experiencing. So that didn't happen. Now, how did I find myself in the center of this larger debate? Um, well, by now, as you all know, it's because of this curve that my co-authors and I published uh, decades a decade and a half ago, um, came to be known as the hockey stick. It became sort of an icon in the climate change debate because it told a simple picture. The globe is warming. That warming appears to be unprecedented as far back as we can go. And as happens to iconic results, iconic symbols in the climate change debate, they get fiercely attacked by those same special interests who don't want to see us act on the problem of climate change, who don't want to see us regulate carbon emissions. And so it hardly matters that, you know, a decade and a half later, there's a veritable hockey league, dozens of reconstructions of past temperature that all come to the same conclusion. The recent warming appears to be unprecedented as far back as we can go. Um, although earlier this year, there was a new study. Um, it was uh, the mo most comprehensive study yet um, to use so-called proxy data like we used, you know, tree rings and corals and ice cores to piece together the puzzle of how the climate changed over the past millennia. Um, and they produced their own reconstruction, which uh, essentially overthrew, um, oh, uh, no, actually, sorry, they more or less got exactly the same result we had gotten a decade and a half ago. Um, so that appears to be a robust result. Um, and it led the IPCC to conclude in their most recent assessment uh, just weeks ago that the recent warming is probably unprecedented even farther back than we had gone in our original study, probably at least the 1400, last 1,400 years uh, and, and potentially even farther back than that. But even if we didn't know any of that, we would still know that climate change is real and it represents a threat. Um, whether or not there's a hockey stick curve um, uh, is irrelevant um, to the multiple lines of evidence that tell us the planet is warming, we are responsible for it, it represents a threat if we don't do something about it. Um, so the attacks against me and other scientists, um, I call this the scientization of politics rather than the politicization of, uh, of science um, because it's, it's something more pernicious. It's the way that science is now just a political football to be abused by those who you know, don't like the conclusions of the National Academy of Sciences. They don't like the conclusion of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They don't like the conclusions of all of the major science societies in the US, all of which are on record. Climate change is real, it's caused by us, it represents a threat if we don't do something about it. Well, if you don't like those conclusions, you know, there's a whole cable news network um, for you to <laughs> parallel universe where the laws of physics don't quite apply in the way that we thought they did. Um, 
Well, and so in that vein, back in 2005, as I was getting ready to um, leave the University of Virginia for a new position at uh, Penn State University, I got a letter from Joe Barton, um, the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And it, well, actually, it was a subpoena. I got a subpoena from <laughs> Joe Barton. Um, it demanded all of my personal emails uh, with 30 or so different scientists around the world. Um, based on the fact that he had read a criticism of our work in that prestigious journal um, known as the uh, editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal, and uh, saw this as uh, justification for an open-ended fishing uh, expedition, presumably to find something to embarrass or discredit us with. Um, and various science organizations, AAAS, the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, the journal Nature, all quickly um, denounced what they saw as an obvious effort to you know, intimidate scientists whose findings might be inconvenient to the special interests uh, that uh, fund uh, his campaigns. Uh, I forgot to mention, and I'm sure it is just a coincidence, that Joe Barton was the largest recipient of fossil fuel money in the entire House of Representatives. Well, you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, even the Houston Chronicle, um, you might have thought would be more sympathetic to Mr. Barton's views, all denounced um, this inquisition, uh, as they called it. Uh, you may not be surprised that you know, a progressive uh, congressman like Henry Waxman, who led the effort to bring the tobacco industry to justice, um, would denounce Barton's attacks against me and my colleagues. But what might surprise you is that the greatest hero in this story turns out to have been a Republican, um, an old school pro-science, pro-environment Republican, Sherwood Bullard, um, who denounced his fellow Republican, Joe Barton's attack on my co-authors and me in some of the strongest terms of anybody. Um, and were it not for Bullard um, defending us, who knows what, what would have happened. This was a time when uh, Republicans controlled both houses of Congress and they uh, controlled the presidency. There was literally nothing to stop Barton from pursuing his witch hunt were it not for the fact that prominent members of his own party uh, spoke out and denounced his actions in a way that's almost unprecedented for uh, Republicans to speak about uh, their colleagues so publicly in this way. Um, and, you know, here in Maine, you have the luxury of having been represented uh, by, you know, enlightened uh, Republicans like uh, Olympia Snow and Susan Collins. Um, yeah. Who... <laughs> And of course, Angus King, who can't be here today because he's fighting the uh, Tea Party's effort to shut down our government, um, um, who's, you know, uh, you know independent. Um, and again, you know, so Maine is sort of a model for how uh, Republicans can be on the right side of this issue. It doesn't have to be a partisan divide. Unfortunately, it has become that way. Well, and John McCain also spoke out um, in very uh, strong terms, denouncing uh, Joe Barton's attacks on me and my co-authors. So, you know, the point here is that, you know, there's a quote here, Edmund Burke, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good, it should be good men and women do nothing. And fortunately, in our case, that wasn't true. Um, uh, politicians of conscience on both sides of the aisle came forward to defend scientists when we were under these um, politicized attacks by, uh, politicians representing powerful special interests who didn't like the findings of our science. So, you know, that gives me some optimism that we can get past this bad faith um, debate we're stuck in uh, in our Congress today about whether climate change even exists and on to the worthy debate to be had about what to do about the problem. Um, and the, uh, without uh, going into any detail, you know, there, there's a worthy debate to be had about what approaches to take in solving this problem, and conservatives and progressives should all be at the table. Um, you know, I think one of the best developments, best recent developments, um, when it comes to climate change um, mitigation is the fact that there are conservatives who uh, are coming to the table with uh, sort of conservative approaches like uh, revenue neutral carbon taxes, um, you know, approaches to solving the problem that are consistent with their ideology, but which don't attempt to deny the basic science, uh, science and scientific evidence. And, and that's, that's a positive development. Finally, let me um, leave it on a, a personal note. This is my daughter, um, uh, 
at the Pittsburgh Zoo, um, and that's a polar bear on top of her, and uh, <laughs> we are not torturing our daughter here. Um, uh, at the Pittsburgh Zoo, uh, you can walk underneath a plexiglass uh, tunnel, um, underneath the uh, polar bear feeding pool, and uh, turns out that if uh, you uh, happen to be part of an NSF-funded uh, climate change outreach program for zoos and aquaria, and you know the manager of the zoo, you might be able to get him to throw the fish in the pool when your daughter is walking underneath. <laughs> uh, but on a, on a serious note, um, you know, I'd hate to think that you know, decades later that we you know, might return to this zoo and that my daughter might return with her children or her grandchildren and talk about these amazing creatures that used to exist in the wild before we melted their home. Um, or, you know, coming up to Maine um, and, uh, and no longer seeing, you know, moose um, in the wilderness of Maine. Um, and that, those are just a couple examples. Fundamentally, uh, we're talking about leaving our, our children and our grandchildren a fundamentally degraded planet if we don't take action now to do something about climate change. And to me, that means that this issue isn't just an issue of science. It isn't just an issue of economics. It isn't just an issue of policy or politics. It's an issue of ethics. It's an issue of intergenerational ethics. Um, and all of you in the uh, upper row uh, uh, on top here. You know, this is about, you know, what sort of world um, we are leaving behind for you and your children. And you have to make sure that the adults in your world recognize the importance of us acting now. We can't wait until you grow up. It'll be too late. We have to act now if we are to avert potentially dangerous and irreversible changes in our climate. But there's still hope. There's still time to do it. And I'll leave it on that note. Thanks.